Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here at the Greece Diner at the University of Manitoba. And also a warm welcome for those that join us uh, virtually. My name is Annemieke Vernost, and I'm the Associate Vice President Research at the University of Manitoba. And I would like to begin to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Ishnabe Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, and Dene's people, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. In the past uh, decade or so, I've been working with First Nations governments and communities, and I can share with you that that has been the most highlighted things that I've done in my uh, career. And I would like to thank elders and knowledge keepers and uh, others with lived experiences for their guidance and leadership in advocating for better ways. Thank you everyone for the great turnout here in the room. And uh, because you're here in the, in the room, you're lucky because we actually have free cookies there, free tea and free coffee. Uh, so feel free to get up and, and get some or enjoy any other refreshments. The degrees uh, is open for food and other beverages until 8 o'clock, so just uh, to let you know. So um, tonight we will be discussing the decline in global sea ice and what northern communities are doing to prepare for the impact of climate change. The UM Knowledge Exchange is a continuation of the former UM Café Scientific Program, and it is an important opportunity for U of M researchers to share emerging knowledge with members of the public and the wider UM community. UM Knowledge Exchange is hosted by the Office of the Vice President Research and International with support for the UM Learning for Life Network. And chairing the panel this evening is Dr. Feiyu Wang. Welcome, Feiyu. And he is the Associate Dean of Research and Innovation in the Clayton Riddle Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. Dr. Wang is the Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Arctic Environmental Chemistry and he is a recognized international expert in environmental contaminants, particularly mercury. His most recent research focuses on Arctic sea ice, oil spill respondents in marine environments, and the interplay between chemical contamination and climate change. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it off to you, Faye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anamika. I did not know the, the, the note there. I, this, you're not here listening to me. But anyway, so thank you so much. And um, yeah, so I, I actually have a note because the VD asked me that I have to follow, right, the script here. <laughs> so I just want to, to say that uh, before we start, I want to uh, identify or just want to, uh, to, to say a few things how we plan to proceed with the event. So I have uh, three distinguished panelists here with me tonight, and each of them will speak briefly, right? In the academic world, briefly could be anything. So I will try my best to keep them real brief on the, on the topic that uh, we're gonna discuss tonight. And then I will open things up for questions. I believe there will be a microphone somewhere in the room that will magically go around if any of you have questions. For live stream viewers, you can send your questions to the research.communications at UManitoba email address. This email will be monitored throughout the event, and questions may be read aloud or will be forwarded to the panelists after the event. So hopefully we'll get back to you if we did not get a chance to address that. And the email address is also in the YouTube description in the feed. So as Anamika mentioned, the topic tonight is on climate change, on sea ice, and glacier. And here we talk about sea ice, but also glacier ice, and impacts to northern communities. As we all know, with global temperatures on the rise, multi-year sea ice and glacier ice, they're disappearing rapidly, which are having a profound effect on both ecosystems, as well as the, way of, the ways of life in the Canadian North. So what can the decline in sea ice and glacier ice tell us about the future of climate change? And what will that mean to live in our warmer world? 
So this brings me to tonight's expert panel. They are, I'm going to introduce uh, from my side here. First of all, it's Dr. Julian Strove. She is uh, our very uh, one only, one the only Canada 150 research chair at the University of Manitoba. And uh, sitting beside Julian is Dr. Dr. Da Jensen. She's also one and the only current Canada Excellence Research Chair with the University of Manitoba. And then, last but not least, we have uh, Mike Spence, a proud Cree, but also mayor of, otherwise known as mayor of the town of uh, Churchill. I've had the privilege to work with all the three distinguished panelists very closely over the last few years. With, in the case of Mike, we've been like 20 years. So, and with, um, with uh, Junior and the uh, daughter, of course, they're close colleagues here at the, our faculty. So, all the panelists are at the forefront of the field of the topic of tonight. That's climate change, and both in terms of uh, the rates, observations, rates, but also mitigation and adaptation and community resilience, resilience building. I'm pleased to have them to share with us their perspective based on their own research and the lived experience. So I will now ask the panelists to provide their remarks in order I, uh, they were introduced. So that's, that means starting with Junie. So what's your perspective about climate change and impacts to northern communities? Thank you, Faye. Um, yeah, so, I've, so I study sea ice and I've been doing this, I guess, for about 30 years now, which definitely is going to date me a bit. Um, and I mostly work with satellite data, so my perspectives when it comes to changes in the sea ice environment are really kind of over the last 40 to 50 years for which we have really good data records. But definitely during that time, we've seen these really dramatic changes, especially in the Arctic with the loss of the summer sea ice. So we have about 40% less ice than we had, say, in the late 1970s. But, you know, we've been seeing in the Arctic this really distinct pattern of change that is not just in the summer, it's, it's in every calendar month. And we can also see that it's very closely related to greenhouse gases that we're putting in the atmosphere and also, of course, related to global warming. And when we look at the observations and we can compare it to what models are forecasting for the future, originally we saw that while well, the models were a bit conservative, the pace of ice loss was happening much faster than observed, which was certainly a concern. The models are doing a bit better now in terms of sort of replicating the speed of ice loss in the Arctic, but they do it at a cost. They do it because they have much more warming in the Arctic, so they might be getting the answer right for the wrong reason, but we still rely on models quite a bit to, to forecast what we think will happen, and you know we can try to provide these estimates of when we think the Arctic Ocean might first have its ice-free summers, which, you know, with the current rate of warming, we estimated about 1.7 degrees of warming. We might see our first summer ice-free conditions, but I think the reality is, is that the warming we're committed to at the moment, given what all nations have agreed to with the Paris Agreement, gets us to about 2.7 degrees of global warming. And of course, the warming then in the Arctic is much larger than for the global average, and then this results in about three to four months of ice-free conditions during the Arctic, or in the Arctic, sorry. And I think one of my issues about this has been, I don't think we're really communicating the real risk that we see by having this much ice-free conditions. Of course, it's gonna impact all the coastal communities that are usually protected by ice from waves and storms. It's gonna impact all the ecological systems that depend on the ice. So, so that's the Arctic perspective, and of course, also local communities of being able to travel on the ice. The, those things are all going to be affected by these warming scenarios that we're facing at the moment. Um, in the Antarctic, it's been a bit of a conundrum because in the Antarctic, the satellite data had been showing that the ice was slightly expanding in contrast to what all the climate models suggested should be happening. So all the models in the Antarctic were also showing the ice should be declining in response to global warming, but they weren't. That has sort of changed this last year. We had a very dramatic ice reduction in the Antarctic, much larger than anything we've seen in the Arctic. It was more than seven standard deviations below the long-term mean. And so now we don't know if the Antarctic is starting to switch over, and now it's starting to show these big ice losses that could destabilize, especially regions like the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. So I think it's too soon to say what's happening in the Antarctic. We definitely need to have more commitment to long-term observations 
And this is why I really value the work that Dorta does, because she's looking at the big picture of a big long term and trying to put current changes that we're seeing into a bigger, longer term context. So that might be a nice transition. Yeah, that's a great segue <laughs> to Dorta. OK, thank you, Faye, and thank you, Julian. Uh, my name is Dorta Dahl Jensen. I work very much with uh, ice, with glaciers and ice caps and ice sheets. And uh, you might wonder how that connects to, to sea ice. But there's a lot of melt happening from all these uh, ice bodies on, on land. And the, the, we call it melt from the ice caps. But as soon as it comes out in the ocean, it's called fresh water. And it, it changes the condition in the ocean that there's this much fresh water there. It changes the, the currents in the water, thereby it moves sea ice differently. And in that way, it's quite important for, for what happens um, with sea ice and uh, with the ocean. But fresh water is pretty interesting because when you look at the, the big uh, ice masses, they lose mass in two ways. It melts around the margins of all our ice bodies, but we also have the ice streams that discharge icebergs out into the ocean. And the icebergs, of course, they mingle with the, the sea ice and it has quite impact on, on what happens. But everywhere where we have fresh water that's melting, the fresh water that comes from the glaciers, there's a lot of nutrients coming out uh, into the ocean. So you normally see a lot of primary production. You see a lot of fish. You see a lot of uh, marine mammals there. And of course, that's uh, areas that are extremely important uh, for local communities because that's where they go and that's where they fish. So in that way, the glaciers mean a lot for the life in the communities. And as the ice bodies uh, melt away, then the, 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 the production of fresh water changes and comes in different places. And that way it impacts life and it's important to follow uh, where the ice is coming. But you see, if you look at it uh, on a little longer perspective, as Julian talked about, then uh, the IPCC reports report that nearly all the small glaciers, and that means all the glaciers in Canada, will probably melt away within the next 100 years. So that will certainly change things. It will change the landscape. It will change you know, the source of water for many of the communities. And the Greenland ice sheet will also decline, but it's bigger and it will go slower. Um, so so um, talking about that, uh, what happens with all this water when the glaciers melt? It goes out into the ocean and we see that the sea level is rising. And at the moment, uh, most of the sea level rise is actually coming from the Arctic, from Greenland and from the glaciers. And at present, we have a, a, a rate of three millimeters per year, again, mostly coming from glaciers and from Greenland. Uh, so when we look at Canada, then we see on, on the east coast, we have a sea level rise of these three, four millimeters per year, while the west coast of uh, Canada, there's basically nothing happening because the currents are also changing, so there's nothing there. But then I just wanted to, to you know, give the word to you, Michael, because when we get to Churchill, we see quite the opposite, because we see that the, the sea level is actually dropping. And that's because Churchill is, is at the center of the big ice cap that was during the glacial time, the big Laurentide ice cap. So the ice cap disappeared after the, the, the glacial period. And now we see uplift of the land because it was pressed down by the ice. So, the, so Churchill is lifting 13 millimeters every year. The, but the sea level is, is rising with three millimeters. So in reality, we see a drop of sea level of, of one centimeter every year in Churchill. So in some ways, that's a, a threat uh, from your deep harbor in Churchill that, uh, this, that, you know, that it's getting more and more shallow. But of course, it's slow. During 100 years, it's probably one meter. So there, there is time. And the very last thing I want to say is that uh, um, the big ice sheets are also archive of what happened in the past. Uh, so when we drill the deep ice cores, uh, for example, on the Greenland ice sheet, we can take the small trapped air bubbles out of the ice. So we have concentrations of greenhouse gases going more than 100,000 years back in time. So if anyone asks you, is it true that the greenhouse gas is increasing, we can see it's never been so high. We have never seen values like that, uh, you know, the last 100,000 years. There's no doubt that it's man-made. So I think that will, I'll pass the word to you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, for, first of all, for the university for inviting me. Um, 
You know, I was introduced to the, uh, the university by the late Dr. Barber and, uh, and others like Faye. Um, you know, it, it really inspired me in terms of the importance of science and research. Our community has always been a part of science and research, and that'll go back to, you know, the Churchill rocket range days when they were studying the upper atmosphere. So, in our one of our economic pillars is science and research, so it's critically important to our community. You know, when we go through those steps and talk about climate change, you know, what's, what's interesting, here's a prime example of going back to the early 80s when they were designing a power line to Churchill. They designed it, and by the time it has made its way to Churchill, it was 1987. Who would have thought 20 years later you're getting more lightning, more storms? And now, when we get hit with lightning, hits the line, zap, the power goes out. There is no lightning protection on that line. Isn't that something? Isn't that how it's happened so quick? And, you know, as we go through this, I mean, we're challenged. You know, we're a, a, a tourism dest international tourism destination. You know, the concern that we have, naturally, is sea ice meaning affecting bears, meaning affecting tourism. So, you know, how do we plan for the future if, in fact, we're gonna lose the sea heist in 20 to 25 years? That's gonna change that community. And so, you know, what we look at is we look at how do we adapt to this? So, you look at tourism, you're seeing now in our community that you're seeing more summer tourism, more beluga whales, uh, the landscape that surrounds you, the beauty of the landscape, more creative ideas in terms of looking at other seasons, for instance, the Northern Light season. It's, it's, really, it's really taking off. So, but the fact is, we'll be affected as being dubbed the polar bear capital of the world. You know, the infrastructure that we have, for instance, the storm of 2017, 100 centimeters of snow dropped. The spring melt, we lost our rail line. It was a challenge in terms of getting to the point where we, as one community, uh, worked with other communities in northern Manitoba, we succeeded in saying that we needed to have ownership. We needed to have say in terms of how local ownership will continue to pay attention, the investment that's required to do it, we're at that point. We've succeeded in that point. So as you go along, you have to adapt to climate change and work with science so that you can have a continuing opportunity to survive in the north. The hitting on the, the port and rail line ownership, the Arctic Gateway Group, you know, we're partnering with the university again in terms of how can we best plan for the future? What's, what's it going to look like for shipping products through the Port of Churchill into the Hudson Straits? So we're working with the university. You know, how do we, for instance, the data will tell us that there is an opportunity for shipping through the Hudson Straits. It'll clearly show to the insurance companies that the season could be lengthened and the premiums for shipping, the insurance rates 
you need to, we need to answer those questions and only science can help us. So have, as a community, uh, we welcome the fact, the importance behind science and communities so that we can continue to play a role. You know, you're, you're not going to, nor should, federal, provincial politicians allow growth without partnering with science. You know, and that's one of the things, as we were going through the ownership model for the Portland Rail Line, it was the late David Barber, when we indicated here's where we need to go, he brought the science to the table and became easier for us to understand. And then you reach out to the late Jim Carr in terms of the importance of putting science to what we're doing. He thought, that's phenomenal. That's the only way you're going to develop, especially Candace North. You've got to work hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. I think we got a really good flavor of uh, fundamental research, both the present day and panel time scale, as well as as a community. It's not just the seeing climate change firsthand, but they are way ahead of us in terms of uh, preparing the community to adapt, to mitigate, and to build the resilience. So I think that um, opens up uh, very well for hopefully uh, some questions, uh, food for thought from the audience. I think we have a mic in the room, yes, so if any of you have any questions, uh, yes, there's one here, okay, from online. Yes, we have our first question from online. Uh, from our online viewer, Elaine asks, how much is the ice melt accelerated by volcanic activity in Iceland? Well, um um, one thing we can do from the ice cores is, is compare them with uh, the vo volcanic eruptions that has been uh, in the past time. Now the, the, uh, we see all the volcanic eruptions in Iceland very clearly in our ice cores. Uh, but the, the, on a global scale, uh, the eruptions we've seen in Iceland have still been quite small. So if we go to one that's even bigger, like uh, Tambora or, or, some, yeah, or similar sized uh, ones, we can see by comparing ice core data um, with the tree ring data that when we've had a, a big volcanic eruption, we cool the summers in the coming 10 years, and then it goes back to normal. So we know we can have even bigger eruptions, but they happen very infrequently, like every 50,000 years, and uh, this can give a, a bigger scale. And we had one of these kinds from Iceland called uh, uh, North Atlantic Z2 55,000 years ago, and uh, we find ash in all our ice cores in Greenland, showing that the whole Greenland ice sheet was covered with uh, ash at, at that time. Um, so that was quite big. Unfortunately, no one really knows how much it cooled the climates in these years and how long time. So, so volcanic eruptions can cool the climate, but it, the ones we've had the last uh, 10,000 years doesn't seem to have impacted climate for more than like 10 years. Thanks, Dr. Any other questions? I'll, I'll just make a, a, just a follow-on comment from what you said, because I remember the Pinatubo eruption. And then I was in Greenland that summer in 93, and it was a relatively cool summer. So that one had an impact for about a year, year and a half. Um, but that's probably the last one that really affected the climate for a period of a year or two. That, that's, to that's totally correct. Uh, the famous Aya Fjellökull eruption uh, that put a lot of ash up in the atmosphere didn't really change the climate, but it took down all the airplanes for so <laughs> a while. And if I could add up the thing, my group was just working with the daughter's group in Copenhagen two weeks ago. We're looking at the ice actually taken to, uh, from, Green, from uh, Greenland. Literally, you can see when there's a historic volcanic eruptions, you can see the ash layer and so that's one of the reasons why we're studying glacier ice it provides that record and then we of course try to relate to other environmental changes other impacts that we see from other records 
Yes, this. Um, can you see periods of mass melt in the ice cores? Presumably the, the ice would have melted and there wouldn't be greenhouse gases frozen in the ice cores because they would have been released during the melt? Well, that's a super good question. Um, we had a year, 2012, where we had melt all over the green ice sheet. Um, but when you get into the center parts of the ice, when you, when you have melt on the surface, it, it seeps down in the snow layer and it, it refreezes as ice lenses in the ice. And this uh, ice has no air bubbles because it's refrozen water. So we can look through our ice cores and see where are the layers without uh, air bubbles in it. And then we can make the statistics of the frequency of these layers. And we see that we have increasing amount of these melt layers during the last 20 years. But if we go further back than 20 years, we actually have to go back to the climatic optimum before we see these layers again. So that's uh, using extreme events in a statistical way to say that it's actually getting warmer. I hope that answered your question. No question from the online. Anyone here in the audience? Linda? Uh, Mr. Spence, I was just wondering if you could tell us um, or give us a sense of uh, what conversations are amongst people in Churchill about the sea ice and changes in climate over the last, uh, I don't know, 10 or 50 years. Like, is there talk about it in the community and, and what do we hear? Yes, I mean, uh, yeah, naturally the community is concerned in terms of um, the warming of the the climate in our community, um, you're seeing longer summers. Like I said earlier, you're seeing a lot more thunderstorms, um, extreme weather, weather patterns that you didn't experience before. So, you know, you gotta try to adapt to uh, doing things differently. Like one of the um, tour operators, for instance, um, they have turned two of their, their buggies, and these are buggies that take your bear tourists out to the location. They have turned two of their diesel-powered tundra buggies to electric. So there's a third that they're working on. So people are starting to change in terms of changing how you do things. Like for instance, our municipal waste, for instance, uh, you don't burn anymore. It's, it's dig and bury, but the fact is, I mean, we, meet, we are mindful of the fact that we need to look at some form of gasification. Um, so there's things that we're adapting to. Uh, some of the changes, for instance, is that where we're building in the future in terms of looking where we're building, um, so we got to be mindful of, of that as well. So this is the new reality. You know, we need to change and do things differently. So, yeah. Perhaps associated with that. So from, uh, say, polar bear point of view. So from community point of view, do you see, say, the timing of polar bears, uh, say, um, kind of... Uh, Fine. Of course, they, they will chase sea ice, right? So the seasons are changed. Yep. Do you see the impact of that? Or? Well, you know, going back, let's, let me go back in time. You know, time changes. Going back about 30 years ago, your typical bear season would have started about October 7th and would have ended November 7th to the 10th. Now it's October 13th to November 20th. So that's changed. So how far back do you go? <laughs> you know, so like what, what's it going to look like in time? Um, like I said earlier, you know, you're taking advantage of other opportunities in the tourism world. Longer summers, meaning longer summer activities such as the beluga whale aspect. So we're changing to that. We're trying to find, you know, the opportunities with tourism opportunities. So do you want to add something to yeah. that? Yeah. Well Alex Crawford and I have been looking at the sea ice in Hudson Bay and what the projections will look like in the future 
under different levels of warming. Yeah. And you know, we can see that if we, if we were to hit sort of this 2.7, three, three degrees of warming above, above pre-industrial, that we probably would have another 40 to 50 days of ice-free conditions in Western Hudson Bay. And so when you look at those kind of metrics and that you're extending the ice-free period to beyond 200 days out of the year or getting close to 220, then it's going to be really hard for those bears in that region, I think, to survive. Yeah, that's, you know, we're, they will naturally be affected, will be affected, like other northern communities will be affected. This is naturally changing. That will change northern communities and how you you go about doing your daily living. That's that's what it is. So you're going to, we're going to have to change naturally. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, are you trying to, like, are we trying to get ahead of the curve? Well, we, we need to adapt. Great. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Someone yes. asked my earlier question. So I'll ask a question to Dorta. You spoke about, um, the uh, Greenland ice sheet uh, melting and creating these highly productive areas or zones. So I'm wondering, from an economic opportunity, are we seeing changes in, in fish economies and, and positive re revenues right now? And, and do you see also a, a quick collapse coming? Maybe as law forecasting. Well, um, I think that's a, a, a question with two answers. Uh, because uh, many of the ice streams are, 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 are moving faster, they're accelerating, so that way they're bringing more nutrients out in the ocean. So, for example, around Jakobshaven uh, in Greenland, you see an increase of fishery in the summer months. Um, it's really good. But then on the other hand, I, every time you talk to a community, they will, will tell you that the amount of sea ice has been reduced. Uh, so the halibut, uh, halibut fishing in the winter is, is reduced. So it's a, it's a story with two sides. Uh, I don't, that's not a very good answer, but that's what I can say. <laughs> One thing that we've been looking at in our work is just how the thinning of the sea ice that's there and the reduction of the snow on, t on that ice has allowing more light to come in to the ice. So, you know, if, if you have more nutrients, for example, and you have a thinning ice and thinner snow cover, you could actually initiate under ice algae bloom sooner which is sort of the primary base of the marine food chain, right? So you have these pros and cons. I mean, you're getting more light coming in, so you have more primary productivity, but then again, you need the nutrients. So maybe some regions will become more, bio, more productive and other ones won't because they don't have the nutrients, even though we're getting a lot more light into the ocean now. Okay, uh, thank you three very much for very thought-provoking introductions. Um, I want to pick up on what Mike said about to increase storms and, and uh, you know, the, the currents now of lightning and how things haven't uh, been designed for that. But toggle back to, to Julian. So, you know, you have decreased ice, you have a changing polar front. Can you speak to um, the relationship between warming in the north and increased storm activity, particularly stream weather? I could, but I have a better person in the audience for that. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, when you, when you look at model projections, for sure, you kind of get a mixed bag because you could see actually less storms coming into the Arctic, depending on, you know, the temperature change between the poles and the equator, but it's also dependent on upper level temperatures in the atmosphere, which maybe will actually reduce the overall cyclone tracks into the Arctic. But then again, there's another study that just got published. It's looking at a longer term perspective with data maybe less constrained by observation, showing that right now, at least, the cyclones in the Arctic are becoming stronger and more frequent. But you know, every other year, a new study comes out with slightly different results. So I think it's a bit um, difficult at the moment to really say with confidence how we expect storms to change. But you could imagine that they would track further north because the ice edge is going further north. You can imagine that you have more fuel for those storms to be more, well, stronger because you have more water vapor in the atmosphere. And so when they do occur, the precipitation that they might dump could be stronger, for example, as well. I think when Julian mentioned that she has somebody in the audience, I think she was referring to Alex. Oh, Alex, yes. you have anything you want to add? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think um, one thing that Tim's question there asking about storms, there are more than one kind of storm that we can talk about in Churchill. And I think what Mr. Spence is talking about with thunderstorms, that's more of a summer phenomenon. And to get a thunderstorm, like around here in Winnipeg, we, we get those mostly in summer when it's a hot day in the afternoon um, is when you typically see these pop up. So that sort of storm, you can see it happening more often if you're warming up the atmosphere, putting more moisture in it. But then um, what we've studied more, because it's easier to do, is the large storms, the ones that are like 1,000 kilometers in size. Any model can, can show you those because they're big enough, right? And those ones is where th there's a lot of controversy right now, or maybe uncertainty may be a better way of putting it, when you look at one study or another about what's going on with them. And the stuff that we've done lately has been, I think, just part of that uncertainty with how things will look, because depending on, as Julian said, how much warming you have near the surface versus in the upper part of the atmosphere, how the polar jet stream changes, is affected by everything that's going on in the Earth. It's not just the warming, it's also the moisture, it's also the distribution of the warming and the moisture. And so it's a tricky thing for the models to get right, and they're not good enough yet. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Well, perhaps, Daughter. I, yeah. perhaps I can just add something from the more observational part, not from the models. Because uh, in the, in, when we look at our ice cores, we see big layers of dust that come in the, in the, with the spring storms into the ice cores. And, and if we follow that uh, during the last 100 or 200 years, back in time we don't see there's a big change of, of amount of dust in the ice core. So that's kind of an indicator that the storms haven't changed significantly during the last 200 years or 5,000 years. <laughs> that might not be so interesting here. Yeah, I think that was a very, that's a very good question. In the south, of course, we've seen extreme weather, right? extreme uh, uh, storm and extreme weather. But uh, next, did we hear or do we usually talk about how these extreme events, storms, change in the north? So climate change, of course, has a major impact on this. So we all know the science is there. This is happening right now. How has the governments or countries or who's taken action to solutions to what we can do to mitigate some of these situations because there's going to be some positive impact um, but there's going to be mostly negative impacts right so who's taken the lead and how do we slow things down stop it change reverse course i will start but then i will pass on to the panelists i think what the, the sense i got from uh, mayor uh, spence is that uh, there's really no who, I think everyone has to be part of that. I don't think we can sit here waiting for the politicians, whatever banner they, they wear, and I think it has to really come together as um, researchers, right, and communities, governments, they all have to work together. But I will pass on to the, I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mike is going to say something, but um, before Mike and any of you want to give the crack first. Well, I don't, I don't really know who's taking the lead. Um, I, I think in some ways scientists are naturally conservative. And I don't know if we've really been so focused on the real risks that we're facing. And maybe if we had communicated the risks better, maybe governments would have been acting sooner. I don't know. I think there's so much focus in the political community of trying to limit our global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees. And we're not going to meet those targets. I mean, we're going to probably cross 1.5 by the end of this decade. And I think, you know, this is sort of our, our decade right now for critical action on reducing CO2 emissions. I don't see evidence yet that that's really happening. But, you know, when, they, when you look at science papers and we talk about climate tipping points, there's 16 climate tipping points that have been identified in the climate system. Nine of those 16 are in the polar regions, and six of those will tip before we hit two degrees. And we're not really talking about what is that going to mean for the face of this planet. If you have destabilization of Greenland or the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, you're changing the face of this planet for millennia to come. But we don't really get that message out there, I don't think. And I think even when I go to these higher level policy meetings, they're still just talking about one and a half or two degrees. And I think it's now a fantasy world. We're not going to hit that. So how do we get real action on this? I don't know. Yeah, I'll let well, I Daughter can, I knows. Can, no, I don't know, but we can take a role. Um, you know, we, we live in a world of democracy, uh, so we need to vote for some politicians that will take it seriously and do something. 
because one thing I observe is that people start having, you know, single people start having back conscious uh, because they eat meat or because they buy new clothes or do all these things we know um, are consumers of, of, of energy. Um, and I think in reality what we need is some really top-down decisions, you know. We will not accept a, a car that is, is not on green energy in year, you know, whatever, 2050. And this makes the, you know, everyone change their habits. Uh, car, car companies come out with the cars that are in demand. Um, so we're not going to solve it solely bottom down, only by voting, you know, the right people in. We have to rely on a, on a political system, a governance that, that will do these actions. Only with that, I think we'll really reach anywhere. Mike, of course, is uh, constantly kind of uh, on that front. So, Mike, <laughs> your insight. Well, I mean, it's going to take a team to, to put this together. It's not going to just take one country. But, uh, you know, it's... Um, the thing is, though, it, you know, as we make these changes for the betterment of, of climate change, we, it's got to be affordable. You know, it really has to be affordable. And so that means that, you know, we're all going to have to be on the same page. So that's the challenge that we're up against right now. And the, the, the problem that we're facing is that, um, you know, the science world is not being listened to effectively. And, and that's what the problem is. You know, that, that is critical. Otherwise, why are we doing it? You know, and, uh, and the government needs to play a role in, in being good listeners and making sure that the recommendations that are being brought forward are carried through. You know? We do it for other things, mm -hmm. you know, every step of the way. COVID. Right? Exactly. All right, Gary. We have a, oh, we have yes, a question sir. from online. Uh, this comes from uh, Karen Stock, one of our uh, online viewers. <clears throat> and she's remembering uh, back in the 1930s. She's asking, what happened to the glaciers and ice sheets during the 1930s with widespread drought in North America? We did not have any satellite imagery at that time, but is there data on that now? There must have been widespread ice melting going on. Was this also a worldwide drought and a worldwide ice retreat and seawater level rise? The climate cooled afterwards, and a lot of the interior of North America became green again. How were the forest fires during that time? Is there research on all of that now, since perhaps that might change the communication on all uh, on this situation? Um, and she asks, uh, so this happened before, and would it not happen again? Sounds like a thought to you, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there are ways of seeing, uh, you know, the change of ice, um, especially the, 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 the glaciers with the long tongues. You can follow, you know, the, the line of, of retreat and advance of these glaciers. And uh, this is done uh, worldwide. And uh, we do see changes both during the 30s and during the 60s. It's not uh, worldwide. It's, uh, it's more regional where these changes are, are happening. But we can certainly see them. But they are still so small that we don't, they, they're not really followed by, um, by sea level rise, I would say. Second question is more related to forest. Is any evidence data on the forest fires afterwards? In the, any of you want to give that a try? Well, also in the ice cores, we we can measure, you know, black carbon and other proxies of uh, forest fires, and so we can see how this has changed uh, with time. And and again, with the uh, you know the the glaciers close to the forest fires, like the Canadian glaciers, we do see these periods that were mentioned in in the question, but again, not not globally. Do you see the, the dust storms that maybe would happening in the 30s in North America? Would that have shown up? Yes, we do see um, increased levels. And uh, we also look at the dust particles and uh, make a rare earth um, analysis of them. So we see where the dust comes from. Yeah, and I think what, uh, what Karen was getting at is, uh, is it possible that uh, things will reverse now? And 
you know, what, what's different between what we're facing today and what happened previously? I can start, but I think we can all also answer that. Uh, it is different because we have very high concentrations of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and we haven't had that earlier. And, uh, you know, the unfortunate measure there is, message there is that uh, uh, CO2, for example, has a lifetime in the atmosphere of over 100 years. Uh, so by, um, you know, increasing and increasing the levels, we're actually programming the climate to warm the next 100 years unless we directly can take CO2 back from the atmosphere, which is, is a hard game. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, coming from a computer science background, I see a lot of data when I hear your talks. So I want to know, are there any particular interdisciplinary collaborations you look forward to and why you find them important? I, I really enjoy interdisciplinary collaborations because I was kind of so focused on processing of satellite data and making sure that we're doing as good of a job as possible converting a raw satellite measurement into a meaningful geophysical variable. So I do spend a lot of time with that, but it's really then the impacts and why does this matter? So I, I've, I've been partnering with people who focus on the marine ecosystems, for example, or we recently partnered with polar bear and seal experts or partnering with people that are atmospheric experts to just understand, you know, how does these changes that we're documenting in the Arctic Ocean affect not just the local environment, but also the global environment. So I find it really rewarding. And I'm also, you know, becoming more interested in also how all of this starts to affect public health as well. Because I think maybe if we, if we change some of our messaging and we're looking at how these environmental changes start impacting changes in vector-borne diseases, changing in pollutants, changing in contaminations, how that affects all of our human health, I think maybe that's how you can also get the public to be more concerned as well. Um, I, I, can, I can only add two words, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, because I think that's going to be a game changer in, in being able to analyze uh, these big and vast amounts of data. Yeah, absolutely. I would echo that uh, this big data in terms of the <laughs> environmental climatic data, they are absolutely the big data, real time, both in terms of time domain, space domain, right? So definitely there's a lot of room for us to learn from, uh, from, from folks like you from computer science, other areas. But in terms of interdisciplinary collaboration in general, climate change is not really natural science or engineering or humanity, it's everything. As we hear here, it's both about the, 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 the reason behind the changes, the rates, but also about the impacts and what do we do with it, right? So definitely a lot of what we do, both at this university but elsewhere, is truly interdisciplinary and we often involving if from, from uh, uh, involving folks from natural science, engineering, social science, health science, but also with sectors, with government, with industry, and of course with communities. So definitely everything we do, it's actually uh, interdisciplinary. So definitely we welcome any collaborative opportunities. Gary? So not that we need anything more to worry about than everything you guys have been talking about. Um, I'm just wondering now, you know, with all the fresh, dense water that's making its way into the ocean from the Greenland ice cap, and now Jilin, as you say, we're seeing a lot more from the Antarctic. What do you think about um, the potential for an ice age? I mean, we've heard a lot about the change in ocean currents, the ocean conveyor belt, and if that stops, if that switch comes off, then it could actually lead us into an ice age. So um, what do you think the probabilities of that might be? Gary is thinking about day after tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, my, my husband always thought he was the hero in that movie. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, the, um, if we change the, the currents, we're going to flip the energy between the North and the South Hemisphere. Uh, but but uh, when we saw, you know, the, the, the previous display between glacial and interglacial, um, changes have been driven by changing s solar in, in um, intensity. Um, and now, because we have the high greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, I don't think that would make the climate flip into an uh, inter interglacial period, although it could be, uh, it's a really great idea. It's like a counterbalance almost in a way if you look at it like that. 
Yeah, I think it's going to dist uh, distribute the energy differently on Earth, but I don't think it will allow a, a flip. I mean, it is, it is interesting to look at global temperature maps, right? And, and the only region on the planet that's showing a cooling trend is off the southeast coast of Greenland. So there is definitely a slowing down, probably in that region, and part of it is probably discharge of meltwater from Greenland. It's not coming from the sea ice because you have actually less sea ice being exported through Fram Strait, so it's not melting in the North Atlantic anymore. So actually in that way, you're reducing the freshwater input from the sea ice unless the buildup of all the freshwater that's currently in the Beaufort Sea gets discharged at some point, and that would be a big freshwater discharge. At the moment, that's staying in the Arctic Ocean, so it's really Greenland, the meltwater, that could contribute to the slowing down. Eric. Thanks. Um, I would say that Western science is really excels at generating knowledge, but maybe is not so good at turning that into wisdom. And I would say that indigenous <coughs> science is quite good at merging knowledge and wisdom. So I wonder if you could say anything about what we can learn from uh, First Nations and indigenous scholars. Well, you know, as an indigenous person, it's always, um, you know, the teachings start from, you know, it starts from our parents or our grandparents. You know, it's always been that um, the wisdom's always been you got to be careful in terms of how you harvest and how you treat Mother Earth. And the thing is, it's, it's important that, um, you know, how we treat the land because the land, it's borrowed land, it's borrowed time. So we got to make sure that we respect everything that we do and that it is inspecting, respect the environment and the, the animals that, that continue to be a part of it. So, you know, again, with our community, it's critically important that we play a role to continue to coexist. And, and those are some of the teachings, you know. It's um, take what you need, but also making sure that, you know, we're, we're managing our wildlife effectively when it comes to, in, in this instance, we're talking about bears. You know, making sure that uh, the management of bears are done properly. Those are things that we can do. You know, it's, it's respecting what we have and make sure that, you know, the indigenous peoples are being respected, you know, as we go through these changes. Isn't it, sometimes it must be hard to see that, uh, um, you know, actions of the rest of the world change the climate so much uh, and, uh, and uh, you live with the consequences. I think we all do, you know. It, the world has shrunk, you know. <laughs> you know, how else do you say it? All right, we have a question online. Uh, this comes from Urban Boschman. How will the decrease in sea ice impact the possibility of remote northern communities to maintain their traditional diet? Might this have negative impact on their general food security? Yeah, most, most definitely. I mean, we've, we, we know from community members and also just, you know, looking at the sea ice changes, the safety of traveling on the sea ice to harvest has become more difficult. You hear stories all the time of indigenous communities having fatalities on the ice because their traditional ways of knowledge of how they interpret the ice conditions or the weather conditions is changing. And so, there has been a big issue, not just in their access to food, which is all tied to the sea ice phenology, but also the safety for these people going out on the ice and, and harvesting their traditional food sources. So yes, of course, everything is interconnected. And I, I know that you know, for many of these regions, it's, it's going to change the whole migration patterns. For, you know, Even just thinking about Hudson Bay, I mean, the orcas are starting to come into the bay, and they might be displacing the belugas eventually. And while a polar bear, a healthy male polar bear, maybe could take down a beluga if he doesn't have access to seals because there's no sea ice, he won't be able to take down a, an orca, for example, so he won't be able to sustain his fat stores. So, I mean, this is a problem everywhere. And I did hear, there was a northern community, and I don't remember which one, that actually harvested an orca because it was there, but then they all got sick because I don't know if the, if the meat was bad or, or what it was, but they, they all got quite ill. I think I remember a case of a tuna being caught off the shore of eastern Greenland a few years ago, and they didn't have a permit to 
to harvest a, a large tuna. So they had to try to distribute it between the communities because they couldn't actually sell it. So it definitely the food sources and migration patterns are changing quite a bit. If I could add, I think that's really two, both parts, right? Why is the sea ice change affects hunting and so on? But sea ice itself is also an ecosystem. It's a really seed in the marine ecosystem. So when we see sea ice disappearing, changing, that will have a profound impact on the existing or the, the indigenous ecosystem there. As, uh, as Julie mentioned, you also have invasive species coming in. So a lot of this will definitely affect the traditional way, traditional food and uh, food security. So there's a lot of uh, anxiety in the north, right, to see both in terms of uh, the, the abundance of traditional food, but there's another area which happened to be close to what I do is contaminants. So with the climate change, and uh, you may still have that uh, traditional food item there, but uh, the quality of the food may not be as good, especially from contaminants point of view. Mm -hmm. So that kind of message is uh, extremely important to northern communities. It is also a very sensitive topic. So a lot of us in this room, I can see quite a few of them in this room, will be kind of working on this field, in this field, mm -hmm. and close collaboration with our indigenous Inuit partners uh, in communities. So Mike, you won't have anything to add from a uh, Churchill point of view in terms of uh, food security and uh, related to sea ice change? You know, it, it's noticed, I mean, whether it's noticed in Churchill, you look, for instance, even as you go further south into the Thompson uh, area, for instance, th those trappers, they're not going out until there's ice. And so they're delayed as well in terms of going out for whether it's uh, trapping or hunting. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's, it's obvious, it's there. Like I, uh, last week I was flying out of Churchill and as I lifted off, I looked, seen the bay and the river on the other side was, was wide open. You know, <laughs> who would have thought you would see that, you know, 20 years ago? It would have been solid ice. So it's telling you patterns are changing. So it's affecting every aspect of it. You know, and uh, one of the things that I, sh I didn't mention, but as we all are aware, the investment uh, into the Churchill Marine Observation Facility, I mean, that there, you know, will play its role as we're seeing more vessels in the Arctic, in the subarctic. Um, so, so the intent there is how do you clean? How do you respond to, for instance, uh, spilt oil? Um, a disaster that could happen which could affect marine life in in areas where and we got to be able to respond to it in a timely fashion have a solution to it yeah that actually made me think also about just the noise that affects the marine mammals as well with the increased ships in the regions exactly that that's part that's a part of it as well that we we tend to forget you know and how we're disturbing their their environments well i i feel obliged just to come with a few positive comments as well <laughs> um, because uh, you know uh, getting churchill to work as a deep harbor um, you know having the, the waters open for a longer period is is probably also a positive thing um, and i and i think many places uh, the communities will also have a longer period for for, for the summer fishing uh, from boats uh, so, I mean, there's also some positive things that happens, even though I do agree that, you know, in general, uh, things are not so bright. Well, absolutely. I mean, l like I said earlier, in terms of, you know, we adapt. Uh, we look for other ways of, uh, of looking for opportunities. And naturally, the port, the investment into the port will open up, you know, economic development for you know, the north uh, for not just the north, but prairie provinces in terms of getting grains to market. You know, we need to, you've, you've got to have economic development to, to help with the social issues so that, you know, there is a better life in, in, as we invest in opportunities. You know, so, 
you know, and again, you know, as a port community, as a tourism community, we got to find the balance in all of this. And and uh, the thing is, we we are will have to be uh, will will adapt to, but making sure that the environment continues to be very precious to us. Yeah, I have a, oh, I have a question. <laughs> um, so for the last decade, there are more and more studies about microplastics in all sorts of environments. And I just wonder, as part of your work, I know you, you're looking at contaminants, all sorts of contaminants, but I just wonder if you also look at uh, microplastics. I do, so I, I happen to do a bit of a work on microplastic. I cannot claim myself as the expert in microplastics, but uh, definitely the, one of the surprising discovery, one of many surprising discoveries in the North, right? So one of them is actually microplastics are found to be elevated, especially in the sea ice, when in the Arctic Ocean, in seawater, but also in sea ice. So there's definitely published reports, including our own work on this campus, we have a little piece of Arctic Ocean on this campus. It's called the CIS Environmental Research Facility. And then, of course, in collaboration with uh, Tom Churchill, we have a marine ob uh, observation, Churchill Marine Observ Observatory. And this is where we do this kind of study to see how microplastics get incorporated into sea ice and, of course, incorporated in the marine ecosystem. So the answer is yes, microplastics are found in the Arctic. They're enriched in sea ice and concentrations of microplastics have been found in Arctic marine animals and, and so on. But the concentrations at this time, I don't think they're at any kind of a level of, uh, are not at an alarmingly high level. But that does not mean if we don't do anything, that, that, that scenario will not happen. But uh, just like any contaminants, they find their ways to the Arctic. Anyone want to add to that? I'm just, I'm just curious about the impact of oil and gas companies, mining companies, and like you said, you know, there's a social balance of bringing a better life to the north, but have you studied the impact of all these various companies, drilling, mining, the runoffs, the pollutants, et cetera, and the impact on ice? I haven't, I, w I would say. Um, I don't know. Well, I think Faye is the expert here because she's looking <laughs> yeah, at the I want oil. to see whether they want to address this one. Yes, yeah, so one of the major driving forces for us to study contaminants is related to the economic development. As Dr. mentioned, as the Arctic becomes more accessible, as the sea ice disappearing, right, you do see a lot more development opportunities, both in terms of oil and the gas industry, but also the big thing in the Arctic is marine shipping. So with this, of course, by default, they will bring in, they will generate pollutants, contaminants. So they are definitely evidence to show those emerging contaminants, microplastics, one of them, but there are other uh, contaminants directly related to oil and gas. One of the big issues right now in the Arctic is oil spill, right? So what if you have a major or moderate scale of oil spill in the Arctic? We know in the South it happens, right? We're so lucky that uh, in the Arctic, at this stage, we haven't really had a major oil spill. There were incidents in the south of Alaska and so on, but in terms of the Arctic Ocean itself, we've been very lucky so far. There haven't really been any major scale spill. But with this increase in marine shipping, there's a good chance that the spill will happen. So what do we do with it, right? So in this audience here, we have a few people, for example, working on, if you have oil spill in Arctic marine environment, in ice environment, can we rely on natural processes such as microbes to degrade oils? And uh, there are also other studies study working on to respond to oil spill, say by using dispersants or using, in my own case, studying fire. The, the earliest, the easiest way, the earliest way to respond to oil spill is to burn it, right? But if you have oil spill in the Arctic, in the presence of ice, can you burn it? And uh, what are the secondary contamination pollutants generated from the smoke as well as the uh, residue in that uh, oil, burnt oil. So yes, the answer is there are contaminants, definitely contaminants are going to be increasingly found in the Arctic, but in the meantime, there's a large group of uh, people working, study the fate, the effects, and also 
the technologies to remediate, to respond to those contaminants in the Arctic. So w one of the things we haven't talked about is, of course, by losing, losing the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, it's one of the reasons why the Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet. And of course, that also starts to impact on permafrost thaw, which then also can release more contaminants into the ocean as well and into the communities like mercury, which I guess you've focused a bit on in your research. Yes, yeah, that, yeah, that, that's a, a, a different story. In that case, mercury is already stored in the permafrost soil. So this, yeah, there's a recent study say if the permafrost in say Northern Hemisphere are thawed, right? And what's the amount of mercury that could be released to the environment? The absolute amount is just extremely large, but of course we have to realize if all the permafrost, my own putting things in the context is if all this permafrost in the Northern Hemisphere is thawed, people may not worry too much about mercury. There might be a lot of other things that folks are, are concerned. Mercury would be a small part of that big societal uh, concern. Well, I, I would also like to see it from another side because, you know, um, ships um, right now, they, they, they are allowed to use very crude oil and very polluting oil. And I think we also have to see it from the side that, the, that there will be regulations that the, the, the ships have to use uh, cleaner oil or, or use green energy forms. Uh, so again, that's a place where we should not just accept that they pollute so much. Yeah. It's already happening. So the, there's a, there's a polar code, Canada already signed on it. So they banned the heavy oil, heavy fuel oil that's been used in the past. And now the, every, all these uh, vessels transporting, trans, transiting in the Arctic, they have to go with this uh, light, this, uh, this uh, low sulfur fuel oil, and they are supposed to be less persistent. And uh, so, yeah, things, changes are happening. So I, yeah, in terms of putting con this in the context, the science does affect, that does uh, make a difference. It just takes time, it takes uh, perseverance. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make a comment when we were talking about the use of uh, oil, diesel. The communities of, uh, of Nunavut um, just, as you know, just north of Churchill, they're looking at changing the use of energy. They're looking at a, a power line from Manitoba, a fiber line from Manitoba to their respected communities. And it, it's clean. It, it's the right thing to do. Less issues with, you know, the possibility of spillage. And uh, so they're looking at it, and they're they're you know naturally as a community that supports what they're what they're doing. We we like to see that realized, and uh, you know they're negotiating now, you know with levels of governments to see that improvement. Absolutely, hydrogen and ammonia. So those are the greener energy. I always say I don't say green energy; I say greener. That's <laughs> any energy you can argue that uh, it's not necessarily what do you call green energy, right? It can be greener than Fossil, fossil fuel, but definitely that's the, that's the trend, that's the, that's the direction to go. Yeah, I have a question that, uh, I don't know if it's fair to ask, but I'll ask it. Um, so uh, Mike commented on the, the, um, the big snowfall and the catastrophic flood associated with it that took out the rail lines, the rail lines and lifeblood for the communities going up into northern Manitoba. Increasingly, winter roads are, are late to form and they're increasingly unreliable, shorter season to, to ship goods and, uh, and so forth. Um, even though we have thinning sea ice, uh, there still is sea ice, so isolated communities are, are heading out to, to sea, you know, to, to, to fish, to, to navigate. People are going by snowmobile, trying to get across from community to community. I guess what I'm getting at is accidents are happening. Right, so communities are being isolated. Um, there are situations where, where um, community members are, are, are essentially trapped on islands or on ice flows, and they're in need of supplies and assistance. And so in general, how prepared is Canada for climate change in the north? Mike, you want to start? Well, you know, naturally it's obvious that they're not prepared for this. And, uh, and it's something that communities continue to, you know, lobby respected governments in terms of the challenges that they have. 
So that's going to mean investment in other forms of infrastructure. So um, again, you know, you, you have to look ahead and it's critically important that naturally investment continue to happen, but in a way that, um, you know, commute, those communities will continue to be affected by this. So there needs to be a solution that means investment into infrastructure. That's the only, what is the answer? I, There's I, only one answer. Yeah, I think it also advocates for more maybe regionally focused studies yep. to help individual communities because yep. sometimes as scientists we don't do these focuses on just on one community. We look at maybe a bigger picture. Yep. Um, it's probably harder to get studies published that are just focused yep. on a community and, and we try to get things published, but I do think there is a need for more science that is community driven as well and have communities sort of tell scientists what they need to know to help them prepare. Absolutely, that's what it's going to take. You know, it's going to take leadership to, to change all of this. And uh, it's all part of, you know, um, developing a plan forward and getting united in the respected areas that you're from. You know, and I'll say it, you know, when we were challenged with, um, with the rail line uh, outage in Churchill for 18 months, it, it, took, it took a region to come together and say, you know what, we're going to have ownership here because at the end of the day, we know it's important to continue to reinvest. Because what happens is that, as we all know, big business is looking for profits and off they go, right? And then governments are left, communities are left with the ongoing problem of reinvestment back in. So smart investment is the way forward. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, makes climate change difficult to approach is the scale of the research and the scale of, uh, of the impacts. Um, you know, right now in Winnipeg, it's, it's the weather is quite surprising. We are in late November and we've got green grass on our yards. Uh, the, my question is, are we now seeing in our own backyard the impacts of climate change? How can we, uh, as people in s just located in Winnipeg or southern Manitoba, uh, understand the difference between the impacts of climate change and weather? Mm -hmm. I have been well, complained about it, my green grass in my backyard. Yeah. You, you don't like the green grass right now? See, some people might really like, like it. I like oh, you like it? I, like, I haven't. <laughs> oh, you're not, you're not critical of it. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, climate and weather are, are two completely different things. And for climate, we're looking at long-term changes. And weather is just something that happens from day to day and changes from day to day. I think where weather then does become climate change is if the statistics for extreme events changes over time or if the intensity of these weather systems changes over time, then we start referring to weather as climate change. But, you know, it often gets mixed up in the media, I think, quite often. But there's a lot of work. I, there's a website, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but I just learned about it um, recently at a meeting, which is actually now trying to, when there is an extreme event, they have a, a model set up, and it's using artificial intelligence, to actually quickly ascertain whether or not that event was driven by climate change. Did, did climate change really lead to that event being as extreme as it was? So these kinds of attribution studies are something that scientists are very focused on now so that we could yeah, quickly get that information across to the public. Are there comments, questions? Linda. Uh, just to change the topic slightly, I wanted to ask about the Antarctic. Um, so, do you have any theories about why what's occurring there is different than the high Arctic? Or is it just lag or different scenarios there? Well, and, and if there's anything we can learn from what's going on there to influence how we uh, address climate change in the north? Well, I mean, first of all, the Antarctic is geographically, geographically a very different system. So you have a continent at the pole and then the sea ice extends outwards from the continent. And 
one of the things that had been happening was that because of the ozone hole, scientists believe that it was strengthening the circumpolar winds around the Antarctic continent. And what that essentially does is it pushes the ice away from the coastlines, but it's still cold enough in the winter so that ice forms in the newly open water areas. And so that's one of the reasons why the ice had been expanding. And that is something that wasn't well captured in the climate models. Part of it too was it seemed like the models in the Southern Ocean, especially in the Ross Sea sector where we had this big expansion with the winds really blowing the ice away from the coastline, um, the models seem to have too much ocean heat flux in that region, so they were melting away the ice. Now, one thing we've been noticing with the climate models, if you run the models at a much higher spatial resolution so that you can capture the small-scale ocean eddy processes, a study came out a couple years ago that showed once you do that, you can actually reproduce the observed changes that ha were happening in the sea ice. So the ocean processes were really important to get right. And with those same model configurations, this year's dramatic drop in the ice conditions was a result of warm ocean water reaching the Antarctic sea ice and melting it. Whether that was driven by the fact that you have a very strong El Nino this year and that maybe that could have altered some oceanic circulation patterns that led to the, the melting of the ice this year, I think that remains to be seen. But there's also, we know that the ocean has been absorbing most of the heat. So most of the heat that's been happening in our climate system is going into the ocean. And it's going not just into the upper layers of the ocean or the middle layers, but it's also going into the deep ocean. And in the Antarctic, they've been seeing now from some buoys that I saw some data on a couple weeks ago, they saw these warm pulses of deep water actually reaching the underside of the ice. So there's some fundamental changes in the ocean circulation patterns that maybe are now what's driving the changes that we're seeing. Um, but certainly the complexities are, are quite different between the two systems. I mean, the Arctic Basin is closed, surrounded by land. There's only so far the ice could expand, whereas in the Antarctic, it's, it's been a different system. Maybe I can add a little to that, um, because uh, Antarctica is just big. You know, it's uh, 10 times bigger than, than Greenland. Um, and, and any structures we have in, the, in Canada. And, and that just means that the climate is not the same all the way around uh, Antarctica. And actually, if you look at the map of you know, the global warming, you'll also see patches of, of cooling uh, around Antarctica. It's just so big. Um, and uh, so that way, it's interesting to see that the, the temperatures are so amplified in the north. Uh, but in Antarctica, you don't see the same amplification of temperatures. Um, so in that way, Antarctica is behaving very differently. And it fits what we learned from the long-scale observations, that there's kind of a, 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 a balance between the north and the south. So if you see something in stream in, in the north, you, you might often see something that's a little opposite in Antarctica. And, and I think that's what we are seeing right now. But uh, we all also have a lot of evidence that as the warming continues, we're also going to see a lot of melt and mass loss maybe more mass loss with discharge of icebergs from Antarctica. It's not going to continue to, to be so passive as we see it now. I guess I would also bring in the point that, I mean, most of the land mass is in the northern hemisphere. And most of the southern hemisphere is ocean. Yeah. And so the heat is going into the ocean. So that's a very different system than what we have in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Yes. I have a question for Mayor Spence. Um, in the North, you're experiencing the impacts of climate change perhaps earlier, perhaps more intensely than we are in other places. Well, what can we learn here in southern Manitoba and the rest of Canada from your experiences? That's a good question. Uh, well, uh, you know, nationally, we're, you know, we're seeing, we're noticing it. And it, you know, it's, t it's taken some time for us to notice some changes, but it, it's noticeable. One of the things naturally is that for, for us, I mean, again, it goes back down to the whole aspect of, of making sure that, um, like naturally we, we gotta, we know we have to adapt and we're adapting to it. We're trying to adapt to it. The fact is, is that, you know, as a country, um, we've got to make sure that the investments that we're doing are smart in terms of making sure that 
there are some benefits, there are some outreaches that, um, you know, we can benefit from. You know, it's, it's truly a, you, like you said, you're, the difference in Churchill and the difference is Winnipeg is that from what I've noticed, you're getting a lot more, um, if I would say, uh, tornadoes, for instance, you're getting hotter weather at times, your, your, uh, your storms are a lot different than ours. Uh, what we're seeing, we're seeing more, more thunder, lightning. Um, so, you know, we, we just need a plan forward like everybody else does. How do we adapt to it and how do we, how do we mitigate all of that? You know, it's, it's, it's tough, it's hard. But at the same time, like I, I went, as I said earlier, is that, um, you know, we need, to, we need to understand and work with our science and researchers so that we can change in how we do things, but also how do we entice government to make some changes so that we can adapt in an affordable way, you know. We can put all those stops out there and governments can say we need to change, but if it's not affordable, how do you, how do you get there, you know? I have a question, yeah. Uh, to Julian and, and Dorta, you both are powerhouses in international polar research. who have come to Manitoba, and to, so far tonight we've heard um, things, you know, people have asked you any questions about what's the, what the state of, I'm really curious to know what are the burning questions you have right now in your current research. Um, so what is the driving research hypothesis that you're, you're bringing and moving forward with your research on? And to Mayor Spence, who's a powerhouse and you know polit politician, a community leader who is endorses and and, and uh, um, works so hard to get relationships with research and science. What is the, your burning questions? Uh, what would be the top question you would have and would want your your answered by our researchers at University of Manitoba? That's an excellent question. So, okay, Julian. well. At least with, with my group at the University of Manitoba, I've really been trying to focus a bit more on community relevant science. So we've been really trying to sort of push this idea that, you know, we, we engage with local communities, we find out what are the science questions that they want to ask, how can we provide climate indices or some sort of information that they could use more readily. So whether it's trying to provide um, sort of ice hazard maps that go into the Siku app that can allow for safe travel on the sea ice, for example, in northern communities, or looking at maybe changes in extreme weather patterns, things like that, and how it'll affect food and water security. I think those are all really interesting things and things that I hadn't really focused on so much until I came to University of Manitoba. Um, the other thing, though, I was just recently at the World Climate Research Program Open Science Conference in Rwanda, and it was the first time I was at a science conference where I saw a lot of talks from the Global South. And you don't normally see that in the in conferences in the Northern Hemisphere. And it really kind of drove home the, the idea that, I mean, what we've been doing in the Global North is disproportionately affecting those in the Global South. And yet we really sort of ignore this region in terms of our research as well. And especially given the recent changes in the Antarctic, which I don't know if it's a sign of, of where the directions good things are going to head, but what would be the impact of these large changes that are in the Antarctic now on the global south? So I think those are some of my kind of new avenues of research that, that I want to go into at the moment. Delta. Yeah, well, I just have to say that a change for one year, I think, is, is very short statistically. Oh, yeah. I mean, next year it might be, be differently, yeah. um, but th that wasn't the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, for, I think for me, um, one of the very burning questions is, uh, how can we um, bring down the uncertainty on our knowledge on sea level rise? Uh, because right now, um, we're talking many places about uh, sea level rises of the scale of, say, 70 centimeters, uh, in the year 2100 with an uncertainty of, of 60 centimeters. So the uncertainty has the same size as the change itself. 
and uh, it, it's, it's extremely expensive um, to, to protect yourself against sea level rise, uh, f especially for, you know, there are very many people in the world living close to the ocean, and uh, it's in many places you have to give up uh, an area to live in, or you have to make very strong dikes around them. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it, the, those that are most uh, hit by sea level rise are often in very poor communities uh, in India and uh, Bangladesh, as examples. Um, so, so to know what the sea level rise is going to be or to bring down the uncertainty, I think it's really important for us to prepare ourselves for our future. I know that was a, that was a very global answer, and uh, I, I echo um, Julian in saying that for me, one of the very, very great things about working in Canada is the very strong community connection that's related to the research, which I find is important. But if I should end up with another burning question, that is how are we going to, take, to make the world take it seriously that climate change is really an important issue to address right now, not in 10 years? So Mike, as a resident of a northern community and as the mayor, what's your burning question? Well, I guess my question would be that, um, again, you know, as we, as we go through this whole spect of uh, climate change. How do we, you know, are, are, and it's gonna take a partnership to make this happen. You know, we, we can go to government and say you need to change the rules, but the fact of the matter is, is that, is governments prepared to work a lot closer with communities and researchers so we can identify how we can get through this collectively in a way that we can live in harmony because right now there are a lot of issues pertaining that we're not dealing with it's the some of the energy that we're using um, it, it, there's a whole host of things but at the end of the day we need to find a solution to it so it's it's again it's going to take partnerships and governments and and communities and and researchers need to work in harmony to get this done so how else are we going to otherwise we can be talking about this for many many years and i, I won't be around actions actions right so look at the time i think uh, well <laughs> anamika just uh, gave me a, a sign so we are approaching the end of uh, this um, this knowledge exchange event i want to thank you all for being part of this, both for those who uh, attend, attended in person as well as uh, online. And thanks to our panelists, it's been a great uh, event. So I, want, I, would like, I hope that, um, that all of us had this um, impression that at the University of Manitoba, we are doing impressive, we're really in impactful research, both in terms of the fundamental science of climate change and sea ice change, of course, but also from a northern community point of view, they are they're not only uh, seeing the, the, the change, but they are actually at the, the forefront of making adaptations and, 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 and to, to find opportunities to reduce risks, to mitigate risks. So wh whoever work in this field, I hope you find that there's something that all of us can contribute. Climate change is not just the climate change scientist's job, it's everyone's job. If I can end up with another kind of personal thing is, uh, I also would like to highlight that, um, that we're a maritime province. So this is the line uh, everywhere I travel, within this country or globally, I always introduce myself as Fei Wang from the maritime province of Manitoba. <laughs> of course, we're all proud as a, as a prairie province, right? But we do have our oceans, so the next time if you're planning your family or friends, planning an ocean vacation, you don't need to go to Florida. You don't need to go to California. Mayor Spence is there welcoming you. We have our own shoreline, we have our own ocean, right? We have a uh, great place to, where you can see, you can see climate change, the science, the rates, and adaptation, the, how communities are facing the challenges, addressing the challenges on a daily basis. So with that, I will pass this to Anamika, maybe.
Sorry, yeah, no, I just want to uh, thank the panel for uh, the nice discussion. I think it was a great evening, and thank you, Faye, for uh, hosting this. Uh, very much appreciated. And for people in the room, uh, it was really good to hear your questions and also the questions online. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Come to our next uh, UM Knowledge Exchange. Come back, same location, same treats, free coffee and cookies. Uh, so I hope to see you again. Thank you very much.